to another episode of Found, a conversation at the intersection of Christian faith and culture, where we always aim to find Jesus in the way we react and respond to our world. Found is a part of the Saddleback family of podcasts. My name is Linda Tokar, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Brandon Bathauer. Work has morphed into a kind of religion, promising identity, transcendence, self-actualization, and community. The religion of workism. Now, if you think about the cultural discussion around work-life balance, I think you even said that a little bit earlier. <laughs> By definition, if I have to balance work with my life, then no life is happening at work. They're actually <laughs> that means work is not life. Right. It might be death. Yeah. <laughs> this reign and rule, this creative order bringing work we're commissioned to in Genesis 1 and 2. That continues on, and we get to be a part of it for all of eternity. Hey, Brandon. Hey, Linda. How's it going? It is awesome. It is awesome. We are recording on a beautiful Monday afternoon, and it is gorgeous. It's very nice. Yeah, this is a summer summer episode, so, man, we are in and out of vacation. Right. Yeah. Just spent a weekend up in, in Big Bear. It's beautiful, mm. beautiful up there. It's really, really nice. Get some of that nice mountain air into your lungs, you know? <sighs> Sounds lovely. It was. So I guess we can just jump right in. Oh, it's a good one. We got a good one this week. Yeah, I'm excited. So in this episode, we are talking about work. So now let's face it. We spend the best waking hours of our days for nearly the entirety of our lives doing some kind of work. No matter who you are or where you live, no matter your socioeconomic station or your geographic location, no matter whether you gain income from it or not, we all work. We all have tasks that we do that are moving us or others forward. But work isn't limited to just those tasks done in the employment of somebody else. In its simplest sense, work is to do something that involves physical or mental effort. That's the Oxford Dictionary definition. So whether it's where you punch a clock every single day, or maybe you're caring for children or elderly parents, or maybe you're going to school, it's work. And right now, culturally, socially, we find ourselves in sort of this experiencing this tectonic shift in the way that we think about work. We had two years of work from home. We were disoriented from all of our routines, all of our patterns, all the ways we thought things work. Um, And people are beginning to ask really important questions. Things like, what am I doing here? (laughs) Why am I doing it? Does it even matter? Um, Just for for the sake of perspective, some statistics that help us recognize how widespread these questions are. In March of 2022, it was called the Great Resignation, 4.53 million workers quit their jobs. And then even more specifically, um, people between the ages of 18 and 29 years old, 37% of them quit their jobs in 2021. So one in three looked at what they were doing every day and went, I'm not doing this anymore. We are asking important questions about work, and I am excited to jump into this. So, Brandon, talk to us a little bit about where we're going with this episode. Yeah, yeah. So, when we were thinking about this episode, man, with the re- great resignation, um, that, those numbers were just in America, by the way. Right. Um, the questions, again, that arise. What, what, is, what is my work? How is it connected to who I am and my well-being and my thriving in life how does this all work and then you add to it the the challenges now of what was called the great reconsideration that after a bunch of people quit then they look back at their previous jobs and go man Mm. this new job that i thought would fit my passion sets a little bit more was maybe more of a fit or it it was a little more flexible so i'd have more time for the work-life balance or whatever it is that people are going man that's not helping me find contentment either right and so man there's a lot of confusion and it's really around this big question of work. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're, we titled this episode, uh, Three Stories of Work. And the reason we're calling it the three stories of work is we want to kind of contrast these three different perspectives, these three different stories we tell ourselves about work and how that shapes who we are. Now, here's the thing. We are shaped by stories. Imagine this. Let me just play out a little picture for you. Imagine you're at a bus stop. And somebody comes walking up to you and and says, the Jets are blue. And, okay, Jets are blue. 
Now, you're going to have a couple stories to tell yourself about that. You can think about that person. Well, maybe there's some type of mental illness here. And someone's just coming up, they're saying the Jets are blue. I've never met this person before. Okay, maybe it's some type of mental illness. Okay. Um, you're going to respond a certain way if you think that that's the story of what's going on there. You, you may, you know, slow down and ask a little bit more about what that person is meaning. Uh, the second story, you know, that you may tell yourself is, okay, maybe I looked like somebody that was at the bus stop yesterday and you guys were having a conversation about jets and you were wondering what color it was and now you're coming up to confirm, hey, the jets are blue. <laughs> right. Well, then, if that's the story you play in your mind, then you're going to respond to the person and say, oh, you know, I'm not so-and-so, whatever. Or you may think, okay, this is a this is a spy for a foreign <laughs> nation, and this is the code word. And so, man, man, you better call the police or try to take that person down because they're a spy. Right? The way you respond to that person in that moment is based off of the story you tell yourself about what is happening there. And the same thing goes into our work. The story we tell ourselves about work will shape every moment from the moment we wake up to the time we're driving in or getting involved with whatever our work is, to the actual work we're doing, to how we feel when we're heading back from work, all of this is defined by the stories we tell about work. So we're gonna contrast three of them. Now in previous episodes, we've contrasted mainstream culture with churchianity and then kind of triangulated Jesus with that. What we're wanting to do here for this episode, just to try out something different, is we're gonna compare uh, what we're going to call an incomplete story about work. We're going to contrast that to what we're going to call a misguided story about work. And we're going to end with the untold story about work, an often untold story about work, which is where we'll find Jesus. Now, what's great is all three of these stories are actually found in Scripture. The great thing is the Bible being written so long ago and so beautifully representing humanity, and they've nailed it. They've said, hey, <laughs> like... The writers have said, look, we, we get work. We have an understanding of how work works. And so uh, we're going to kind of dig into these three different stories, one from Genesis 3, one from Genesis 11, and then in the last one, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2, kind of walk all the way through to the last chapter of the Bible. So <laughs> yeah. whew, get like strapped in. Here we go. Yeah. Yes. And just a note. Uh, with the length of this podcast, we're diving into these three different narratives. Feel free to listen to one of them and hit pause and think about it for a while. This may be a lot to kind of take in in one setting. If you can, awesome. But know that we've kind of built it in these kind of three chapters uh, so that you can do that. Kind of listen to one of them, think about it, wrestle with it, think about what scripture has said about it, and then move on to the next one when it works well for you. So story one, we're calling the incomplete story that work is about survival. Linda, take that away. Yeah, absolutely. So this idea, work is survival, it's just something you've got to endure. Um, really, this comes from, or it is, it is, seen in Genesis 3. And just to set the stage in Genesis 3, Satan has appeared as a serpent. He has tempted Eve and to um, disobey God. She has done that. Adam has disobeyed God. God has now come to them. And, and he is talking to them and he's announcing sort of the result of their rebellion against him. And I'm going to read um, from Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. And then we're going to go back and pull it apart. This is what it says. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will, bring, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. 
a little bit bleak. <laughs> what a happy picture of work. Right. <laughs> and yet this, this reflects the thorns and thistles. Work is hard. I mean, if you look at memes on, on the internet about work, it's all like work is unfulfilling. Your coworkers are annoying. You're going to be underpaid. You've just got to survive it. Everybody's working for the weekend. I mean, that's what our culture says about work. And we see it right here in Genesis 3. So I want to now back up and start in verse 16 and kind of walk through kind of what Adam and Eve probably heard as God was saying this to them, but then also think about what underlying principles do we see that apply to work today? And so let's just go all the way back to verse 16. And the first thing that he says, he talks about childbirth. I will make your pains in childbirth very severe. If you've ever done that, you will know, (laughs) ladies, it hurts. With painful label, you will bring you will give birth to children. So the very first thing God says, he's talking about the most creative thing that we get to do as people, right, is to continue the creative work. We get to help create new people. And that is an incredibly amazing thing. And God says, you're still going to do that, but it's going to be a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And I think that from that, we can see, you know, this creative work, this was the first creative work we got to do, but there are other, many other creative things we get to do, but it's difficult Creativity is hard. Sometimes it's just easier to do what we've always done than to make something new because creativity now is, it's difficult for us. Um, So that's the first thing we see. The second thing that God says to the woman, he says, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, when God made Adam and Eve, his original design was that they were co-equal. They were partners together. They had different roles, but they were absolutely on par, equal. And now here we see the beginning of hierarchies. It says that her desire will be for her husband and he will rule over you. And those, this initial hierarchy that happened between Adam and Eve is now played out in hierarchies all over the place in our culture. Things are unfair. Some people have to work a whole lot harder and they get a whole lot less. I mean, it's just, there's not equality the way that God would have designed it. So And there's this competition. There's always this sense of like, we're not working together. We're striving against one another to get ahead of each other. And that finds its roots, its beginning here in Genesis 3. Yeah, so the story of of work here on this this part, right, again is, uh, and you're telling yourself this story. I'm sure some of you are hearing this and you're saying, yeah, no, I feel that. (laughs) Creativity is hard. Man, from dust I've come to dust I will return. I just feel like I'm, I'm just punching the card. I show up to work and my goal is just to get to the weekend, right? right? Like I, I can't wait until my work day is done. Cause then I can go home. Mm-hmm. And when you are at work, you can hear this right in this, this Genesis three, um, bit you're like, okay, first off, yeah, creativity is so hard. Let me ask you if you are listening to this, you are listening to this. If you hear my voice, <laughs> do you feel like creating anything at work? Moving things forward is hard. Yeah, probably, mm-hmm. right? And the Bible is saying, hey, this is a reality of work, right? It, it is really hard. It's really hard to, to create new things, whether it's writer's block or coming up with a new strategy at work or a new initiative, man, it's just going to keep running into these obstacles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then the second one, man, about hierarchies. There's yep. this ladder and wherever you find yourself on that rung, and you got a lot of people way above you and you're carrying a lot of weight, yeah. you know, or the advice again is that you must work twice as much to get half as much. Uh, and you have to say yes so many times before you could ever say no. It's this working up through this ladder and ugh, work is just survival. It's just hard. I don't like it. People are on different levels. This is kind of this story, yep. right? And that's just verse 16. Let's get- <laughs> <laughs> it's, it gets worse. Um, So now in verse 17, we see that it says, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat from it all the days of your life. Adam was assigned to tend the garden. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later, but that was not a bad thing. But now it was going to be work. It was going to be more difficult. It was going, there were going to be obstacles. It says that it will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will, and you will eat the plants of the field. So there's this sense of like, it's getting more difficult. You're constantly striving. You know, 
If you planted a garden and everything that you planted just grew, no weeds, no problem, that would be lovely. But if I do not have a green thumb, but I talk to people who do, and I do know that it, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of, of tending just to get it to grow, let alone to get it to grow well. And so sometimes in the world, in the work that we're doing, it feels like you take three steps forward, you take two steps back, you start a new project, there's all these obstacles. Yeah, it makes me think about um, the old Greek myth of Sisyphus, where he's kind of like cursed to just keep pushing this boulder up a hill uh, constantly, and then it rolls back down, he has to push it back up again. And it's just this constant work of pushing a boulder up a hill. And if I could think of, in verse, verse 17, cursed is the ground because of you, through painful toil, you will eat from it. And then you've got thorns and thistles, and you have to get through all that stuff to even get to food. Um, I'm sure, again, this is how a lot of us feel about work. This viewpoint, this just work is survival. Mm-hmm. And I just have to go in, clock in and clock out. That's the story you're telling yourself. It's partially because of this, because you feel right. like you go to work, you push a boulder up the hill, whether it is you're trying to push your organization forward, you're trying to work on something with your coworkers, or you're trying to sell that thing and you just can't sell it, and you're trying to help the bottom line, and then you get to the end of the day, and it feels like the boulder just rolls back down to the bottom yeah. of the hill, and I got to go start yeah. it over tomorrow. What was the point of all of that? Yeah. And so what, what, is the, what is the philosophy that we end up entering into is kind of like, a, well, work is kind of meaningless. Right. And then you die. Yeah, it's just kind of survival. (laughs) My goal here is I don't care about the rock anymore. I don't care about pushing it over the mountain anymore. There's no real meaning to this. What I do is I push it up. I let it roll down. I collect my paycheck. I push it up. I let it roll down. I collect my paycheck. And that allows me to do the stuff I actually want to do. I I don't know. I always, for this viewpoint, I always picture uh, at the beginning of The Incredibles, uh, Mm, Mr. Incredible, mm -hmm. like, you know, super huge sitting in his little car driving home <laughs> from work, just in the, in traffic and just like emptied and worn out. But what I, what I appreciate is that the Bible is not surprised by the fact that work is sometimes, it feels hard sometimes. It feels pointless sometimes. It feels frustrating. You know, I love the fact that the Bible speaks the truth, what is true. And what is true is that sometimes work is really hard. So as always, we like to try to be fair and say, what are the positives of this view? Like what, what could be positive about this view? And the first thing is that it's true that we do have to work to survive. Even second Thessalonians 3.10 says, if a man does not work, he should not eat. Work is a reality. It's part of what we as people were created to do. Mm -hmm. So, and it's natural. Like I think about, I'm watching that show alone right now, Mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, 10 people get just like left out in nature on their own and they're given like 10 items and they got to survive. And this is the thing, right? If you did that, if we didn't have all of our social structures and everything, if just naturally you go out into nature, Mm -hmm. you have to work to survive or you will just starve. Right. Like as much as we want meaning and fulfillment in work, the reality is. Sure you kind of got to work to survive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you do nothing, nothing will happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, in, in a positive, I think that challenges some of our, uh, some maybe younger viewpoints on work, mm-hmm. uh, where it's like work is all about uh, self-fulfillment and self-actualization sure. and all of that stuff. This viewpoint says, okay, maybe, maybe that has some truth to it, but uh, you also, it comes down to like, you, you got to eat. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I like the fact that in those three verses we just looked at, God did point out the fact that even though he was going to have to work, he did mention three times that he would still get to eat. So eating is important to God. <laughs> and to Adam. Yeah. And to Adam. Um, so another positive is that there is a duty in this. Many people have lived dedicated, focused lives with this viewpoint, keeping work at work and home at home. It's not, I'm not doing my work to become something you know, super duper, or I'm not doing it to um, foster my identity. I'm just doing what I have to do because it's necessary and it needs to be done. And then there's the third piece that this viewpoint does not tie identity to work. We tend to do that a lot. Hi, I'm so-and-so. What do you do? You know, that's our first go-to is to define ourselves by the work that we do. And this just says, no, work is something that has to be done. But I know that my life is more than my work. Even if it's just a few hours a day, there's more to me than the work that I do. But 
as you would not be surprised to find out, this viewpoint has challenges. And the first is that this view means that we can end up resenting and wishing to escape that which consumes the best of our waking hours. You wake up, you get ready, you go to work, and from the minute you get there, you're trying to figure out how to either do the least amount to get by or when when's quitting time. You know, you're watching the clock. Um, this desire to escape, another challenge is that it can lead to excesses. You know, I worked hard this week. I deserve to go shopping. I deserve to go party. I deserve to do whatever it is that I want to do to be, become, explore, experience, whatever, because I have worked hard. I deserve it. So I'm going to do whatever I want during my off hours. Now, if you think about the cultural discussion around work-life balance, I think you even said that a little bit earlier. (laughs) By definition, if I have to balance work with my life, then no life is happening at work. They're actually- (laughs) work is not life. Right. It might be death. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, when we frame it that way, then work is on one side of the scale and everything that's important to me, everything that I enjoy, everything that I want to do, everything that I'm called to do is on the other. Mm-hmm. There, di- it is an un, it's actually an unbiblical separation, mm-hmm. but that's how sometimes we, we structure it. And then in churchianity specifically, there's another sort of weird twist that happens sometimes. And that is that especially like if you don't work in a church or parachurch organization, you work in the, you know, in a secular marketplace job, There's this idea that work is almost an interruption or an impediment to the real work, the work of ministry, the godly things that God has, you know, the Bible says that God has prepared good works in advance for me to do. So I got to finish this boring, repetitive work work that I'm doing so I can go do God's work somewhere else. So this thorns and thistles work is necessary. And then I get to go do the important work of serving God somewhere else or in some other capacity. Yeah. And what that does is that um, compartmentalizes sacred and secular. Right. That I've got the secular part of my life and then the sacred part of my life. And Jesus is not about those separations yeah. mm-hmm. in it's your life. Man-made. <laughs> he is about all of it being under his reign. Mm-hmm. That's what Jesus wants. He wants to be involved in all aspects of your life. So if you have some parts of your life that you go, you know what? That is the part that I don't have Jesus like influencing or reigning right. over. Who? Well, then we're missing out majorly, right. right? That's the major part of your life. And there's no involvement of God or Jesus or his story in that part of your life. Then we're totally missing it. Absolutely. I think the last challenge is that over a lifetime of this view of work, it puts a lot of pressure on the season of life we call retirement, right? Because now I've paid my dues to society. I have worked. I have finished that God awful assignment. And now I'm going to do what I want to do. But haven't we all heard the anecdotes? They people have the list. They have their bucket list of all the things they're going to do in retirement, which they manage to go through in about six weeks or they just can't afford to continue doing them at the pace and frequency that they'd like. And so it puts a lot of pressure on this season of life that says, okay, well, now that you've finished work, now what are you going to do? And people end up doing some kind of work. Maybe it's volunteer. Maybe they finally go take a job at the place they always wanted to work, never thought they could. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of times that's a really positive view of retirement. I think a lot of times people spend the entirety of their lives, uh, working for their retirement And by the time they get to retirement, they're either so broken down, Mm -hmm. they've lost all humanity. They've become, you know, I think about uh, Franz Kafka's um, Metamorphosis. Sure. Where this worker turns into a roach because it's such dehumanizing work that by the time you reach the end, you're, you're, you don't barely even exist and you just have to, like, you've lost all passion for life. You've maybe even lost your friendships and your relationships Mm -hmm. because- yeah, man, that's that's a hard life to just hope for retirement as the big mm, promise. Yeah, that for doesn't sure. actually fulfill. For sure. So, yeah, sorry. I was just going to ask you, what does Scripture have to say about this, Brandon? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Yes. Uh, first off, let's look at Colossians three twenty three because um, it's often used in relation to kind of the theology of work, um, work and faith kind of conversations. Here's what Colossians three twenty three says. It says, "Whatever you do." Work at it with all your heart 
as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Now, there's a lot of context to that verse uh, that we don't quite have time to dig into, but essentially, if we just look at this verse, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Think about it this way. Uh, I think this challenges this viewpoint because essentially what it's saying is this viewpoint would say, whatever you do, work at it with just a little bit of your heart <laughs> as working for human masters. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. kind of what this, what, what that would say, this sure. viewpoint, get your work done. You don't have to work hard at it. You don't have to like put in much effort, clock in, clock out, get it done and, uh, you know, get your paycheck and move on. The Bible would say, no, somehow the work we do is for God. That God actually cares about our work and the work of our hands. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a strange, strange concept for us to to buy into, especially in this viewpoint and, and in this story. So I think that's the first challenge. What would it look like to work at what you do with all of your heart, not because you're working for the paycheck? Right. But because you're working for the Lord, there's a bigger story going on here. Mm-hmm. We'll dig into that soon. Yes, love now, that. The second second bit uh, is just Ecclesiastes just nails work in so <laughs> many ways. Uh, it's such a wonderful book and it's so challenging in certain ways because it's just, it's so deconstructive. <laughs> it yeah. just points out everything that doesn't work. And then you get one verse at the very end that's yeah. like, well, listen to God, do his work, and that should solve it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but it's clearing away. It's clearing away for more answers to come. Ecclesiastes 2, 21 through 23 says, For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. Mm. So this is the thing even about retirement. Like you can just work, work, work for retirement. And unfortunately, I know quite a few stories, some really close to me who worked really hard and then passed away a few yeah. months into retirement or other health issues came in that just stole that retirement away and all that stuff that you saved up for someone else is going to get. Yeah. And this is the thing too, right? You're going to just work and it's going to go to somebody else anyways. You're just working to put more money in someone else's pocket. And he says, this too is meaningless and a great misfortune. Mm. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun all their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest, right? You're just thinking about your next day of work. You watch a show to try to get a little bit of rest before you start it all over again. Yeah. And Ecclesiastes says, this is meaningless. Yeah. This way of living is, is meaningless. And so I don't know if you can get a better challenge than this is meaningless, Yeah. <laughs> this viewpoint. But it's an incomplete story. Again, the Bible says this is true. We do have thorns and thistles in life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We do, there is pain in the creative work, whether it's actual childbearing or any other creative work that we do. The The ground is cursed, right? Yeah. It is hard to bring out good things in the world. Um, but thank God, this is an incomplete story. Absolutely. Let's just look at a couple of ways that you might recognize if you've been over-influenced by this view. And the first one is if you wake up every day and you dread going to work, you may be, you may be deep in the thorns and thistles view. Um, if the goal of your work is to get to the weekend and save up for retirement, if that's all you're thinking about all day long, uh, you may be over-influenced by this view. Perhaps if you find yourself constantly complaining about your work or your coworkers, like it's just everybody's an interruption, everybody's an irritation, that might be a thorns and thistles moment there. And if your mind wanders often to what you'll be doing when you're not working, your lunch break, the weekend, your, you know, vacation, whatever, like if that's what you're talking about all the time, you might be over influenced by this view. All right. So if you're saying that is me. Yeah. uh Uh-huh. Well, just hold on. We're going to get a bigger story in part three. All right. But if you're saying No, I actually really enjoy working. When I'm driving into work, I got all this passion and this energy. Well, then you may be a part of Story 2, Misguided Story.
All right, so story two, the misguided story. The idea here is that work is my route to meaning. It mm. is my route to power and to influence. See, you may not be that person who just drives into work and says, look, I'm an automaton. I just kind of check in and check out. My work is where I find my identity. And guess mm -hmm. what? The Bible says, yeah, we got a story for you. <laughs> Genesis 11. This is the last real story before we start into uh, the story of Abraham and kind of the whole story of Israel. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the last, what they would say as like the the global stories mm -hmm. of Genesis 1 through 11. Um, and here's what happens. Uh, Genesis 11 verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Now God had said, go over the whole earth, mm -hmm. right? Cover the whole earth and multiply. But notice they don't like to do that. <laughs> they like to gather in one little area. Mm -hmm. Verse 3. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Why? So that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see and the the language here is the Lord came way down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan will be impossible for them. They're going to just keep going whatever route they want to go. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. And so the Lord scattered them there over all the earth. Mm. Now, this is the story of Babel, and uh, it has a lot to say about this second story, the misguided story. Now, the overview of this misguided story, again, is that work is where I find meaning and power. That is where it is achieved. My goal is more power and influence and, aff and affluence. Uh, there's a guy, uh, Derek Thompson. He writes an article in The Atlantic, and he calls this uh, workism. He says, in this world of new atheisms, these different things that we're worshiping now, he says, work has morphed into a kind of religion, mm. promising identity, transcendence, self-actualization, and community. Wow. The religion of workism, wow. right? And this is how this story plays out. See, God says to Adam and Eve, cover the earth. We're going to get there in the last story in Genesis 1 and 2, but cover the whole earth. But humans... They're like, no, we want to make a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Now, that seems good, right? Like, good job, humans. You yeah. guys are going to build something great. You have these great ideals and hopes that you're going to build to. But the problem is it's misguided. Mm -hmm. Why do they do this? Quote, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Wow. And that is the focus. What is the need behind making a name for ourselves? Well, it's a viewpoint that says, I'm on my own. Me and my tribe, God's not looking out for me. My identity is left to myself. I got to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. And what I need to do is I need to make a name for myself in the world. That's the best thing I can achieve. They say, look, we got power in numbers. What you going to do, God? We can, we can buck God because we've got more power. Mm -hmm. We are more famous and influential than Jesus. Isn't that what John Lennon said, right? That's this viewpoint, right? We've got the power. We are successful. We've got it figured out. We can make a name, make a mark in this world by reaching higher and bigger and stronger and grander. This is when we talk about winning. I'm yeah. winning. I'm winning. I'm winning. I'm winning at work. I'm winning. Yeah. The viewpoint there is I'm making a name for myself. So where did this come from? Here's a bit of a history of this viewpoint of, of workism. Um, it was true here in Genesis 11, but it's kind of uh, emerged in a new way, I would say, over the last about 50 to 60 years. Yeah. See, historically, what would happen is a person would hand their their work onto their sons. And so, you know, if you're a farmer... You, you did what your father did, you, what you, your grandfather did, and what your great-grandfather did. Your meaning was found 
and carrying on the family trade. Sure. So shoemaker, chef, whatever, you carry on that family trade. But what started to happen is that the sense of meaning started to change. See, in that time, you're going to carry on the family trade, and that is where some of the meaning came. But meaning was also found in your parenting and being a member of society, of being in a family. But as industrialization happened and these corporations came out, this is new things, right? A new narrative emerged where success was found in working your way up the corporate ladder. Sure. See, in a lot of history, you'd like, well, that person's the king and I'm the worker and that's just how it's going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are some really cool things that came from this, right? We have a narrative that you can work your way out of maybe the class that you've been born into. Sure. And there's some really cool stories of that happening. But the problem is we end up working our way up there and we chase, we spend our lives chasing an acronym, right? That's the story of our lives. We want to be VP. We want to be CEO. We want to be COO. That's what we chase after. Now, Babel, again, is a reminder that this has always been in the human condition, but really, I think this has kind of taken on a different manifestation in today's world. Mm -hmm. So, again, workism promises this in work. First off, it says, your meaning is found in work. Listen to any commencement address out of any university. What do they say? Find the work you love. As if work is like a soulmate Mm -hmm. or something. And there's that one job that if you can find it, you will suddenly find transcendence and meaning. Wow. Right? This this is the lie of the soulmate thing of like, if you just find that right person, there's only one right person out there. And if you find- the whole planet. Yeah. And- (laughs) Oops, you didn't find the right person. And so you better try again. Doomed to misery or... Or (laughs) do-over. Yeah. Uh, And it's just a lie. That's just a lie. Nowhere in scripture does it say there is one perfect job waiting for you and you must spend your life chasing after. And once you find it, then happiness will come. Yeah, I think sometimes even in churchianity, it's like you've got to find the the purpose in your work. And it's like, well... I don't feel purposeful in this, so maybe this isn't a good place for me. It's like, we're chasing the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah, you were saying that, um, you were reading an article that basically said, hey, if you can't find this very specific purpose in your work, you should just quit. Yeah. You know, uh, because it's obviously not just the exact thing. Now, look, quit if you're involved in human trafficking. Right, yeah, quit bad job. right now, Run please. away. <laughs> uh, but in most of your jobs, again, there's this, this lie, and this is a little bit behind the great resignation, I think, is people saying, man, I'm not finding that special soulmate-ness in my job. And so I'm going to quit. I'm going to try out something else. And what everyone finds is, oh, this is everywhere. And there yeah. isn't that one perfect job that solves exactly. all the problems. Um, the promise of work for the wealthy is that this is the way to compete with your friends mm-hmm. and really transcend the kind of banality of, of comfort. You know, like you can only get so much comfort. So at that point, you're like, okay, I got the most comfortable couches in the world. I got the best technology in the world. Everything is all set. So what do I do next? Well, I don't know. I just want another billion. Uh, I was talking with uh, with a friend about how uh, there's a point when Steve Jobs was talking to the owner of of Oracle. They're both billionaires, and they're talking about some new initiative. And uh, Jobs essentially said, no, we're going to take the ground on that. And they said, well, do you need another billion dollars? He said, well, if I don't do it, then someone else, else will get that billion dollars. It's that com- competition, that yeah. constant competition. So what What really is that about? You don't need another billion dollars, but it's just <laughs> that is how I transcend. Yeah. That's how I mean. That's how I carry on meaning. Wow. Um, when everything is accessible for you, more power and influence is the only thing that is just barely out of your grasp. So you're going to keep spending your life chasing after it. And on the other side, for the middle class or those in the working class or the poor, this is your way out, right? This is this promise that your chance at stardom or at transcendence or reaching above your community, your family history, your station in life, this is a little bit of that American dream, just a little bit tweaked, where the idea is this is how I I get out of here. Right, and that sense that the question that used to be asked was, are, you know, did you achieve a standard of living that was better than your parents? Mm-hmm. Like whatever they did, fine, but you want to do better. Yeah, do, do better. better. Exactly. And so this is the story, right? And again, we're calling it a misguided story. We'll get into why, but there's some great good in here. Sure. 
But you think about how much you're putting, how much pressure you're putting on this work, mm -hmm. that it is meant to be your savior. Yeah. That is meant to pull you and your kids out of poverty. That if you just work harder, if you just push more, then you'll get there. Now, interesting. Some some really interesting things here. Um, in in current research, they found that rich men are kind of at the center of a lot of this. Uh, here's a quote uh, from this. In 1980, the highest earning men actually worked fewer hours per week than middle class and low income men, according to a survey by the Minneapolis Fed. But that's changed. By 2005, the richest 10% of married men had the longest average work week. Mm -hmm. The richest 10% of men, married men, had the longest average work week. At the same time, college educated men reduced their leisure time by more than any other group. Today, it is fair to say that the elite American men have transformed themselves into the world's premier workaholics, toiling longer hours than both poorer men in the U.S. and rich men in similarly rich countries. This is from that same Atlantic article. So this is such a strange phenomenon, right? That you think in all of history, the greater wealth you had means you get to work less. Sure. But right now, this article is saying that today's rich American men, it's not just them, but today's rich American men chose a strange prize, more work. That yeah. more work is their prize at the end of the thing. And again, that is playing into this story that work is my way into transcendence. I'm building my tower to the heavens. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, as you're talking about this being something that is statistically happening in the men, the, the focus on making a name for ourselves, it isn't just limited to men though, but it looks different for women. So as women entered the workforce in greater and greater numbers during and after say World War II, a narrative developed that said that caring for your home and your children, that's still important, but they were a distant second to the significance and sense of accomplishment that a woman could achieve outside her home in the workforce. Now, I'm not saying women shouldn't work, duh, I'm here at work working with you. So it's not that at all. But what I'm saying is that if the goal is to make a name for ourselves, if we're looking for significance, if we're looking for transcendence, all of those things that you've been talking about, a clean house and well cared for children aren't gonna get you there. That's just work you have to do now in order to transcend that and actually have significance and status and meaning in my work, I've got to do more. And it creates this weird stress because the things that used to be valued are now just seen as like, well, of course you're going to do those things, but now you got to do all these other things mm, wow. to reach significance in the world. I, I remember when I was in college and a friend of mine said, well, I, I have to work because I have to show my daughter how to make a contribution in the world. And at that time, oh, man. I was staying home sure. and I'm like, so I'm not making a contribution, <laughs> right? <laughs> you right. know, but there's that sense that like, oh, if you're just doing those things, th that's not a contribution to the world. Sure. That again, there's this thing of, yeah, this it's whatever your employment is, however you get a paycheck, that that is how you achieve this, uh, this thing. And no, no other way is valuable. Yeah. I mean, it plays out again. So you talk men, women, Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't just that. There's a growing trend across our society. In 2018, uh, this is before COVID and everything hit, sure. Pew Research did a report on youth anxiety in America. Yeah. Check this out. 95% of teens said that, quote, having a job or career they enjoy would be extremely or very important to them as an adult. This was the highest out of all the other priorities of what goals they had in life. Mm-hmm above helping people in need was 81%. Wow. Getting married was mm -hmm. 47%. Only 47% of teens said that getting married and starting a family was important to them. Well, because it's now seen as an interruption and an impediment to, to doing what you really story. want to do to this story because yeah. you have to slow down and focus on these other people if you're going to get married and have a family. Sure, and that gets in the way of me reaching whatever My potential. picture of, <laughs> right. Yeah. And potential is only experienced in work. Exactly. 95% That's crazy. said that, again, finding that soulmate job was the mm -hmm. goal. Mm -hmm. Now, COVID really stirred this up, right? The inability to keep building, kind of keep building that big tower to heaven, right? Everybody was kind of stopped. Right. And we kind of saw things for what they were for a moment. We had to kind of come to term with our addictions to work and mm. our worship of work. 
and we were kind of forced into some of the slower realities of life around us. And that's brought out, again, a lot of questions of like, what, what, maybe this is all just a mirage. Maybe I'm just chasing after the wind, you yeah. could say. Uh, you Ecclesiastes. Could. Yeah. So good. So, okay, if we're summarizing this viewpoint, in almost every commencement speech, love what you do, find your purpose and meaning in the job you choose. In this soulmate view of a job, there's one perfect one out there for me. If I find it, my life will be happy. If I don't, my life will be miserable. If I can just reach to the heavens with what I'm building, we'll get there. Now, mm-hmm. some positives from this. First one is that our drive in this way has resulted in one of the most profitable and comfortable world than uh, in, in any other time in history. And that's amazing. That mm-hmm. came from a lot of people that were pushing and prodding and Absolutely. really hashtag hustling. Um, <laughs> And while there are deep divides in income inequality, there are more people than ever that have been welcomed into middle-class lifestyles, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. getting access to more luxuries than ever thought possible. Look, I know a lot of times when we think about income inequality, we are overwhelmed by some of the poverty that we can see even in our own country. At the same time, the amount of technological advances, the amount of societal programs and systems. This was a result of a lot of people that were working very really hard. hard. They yeah. weren't doing the first story of just coming in, checking the, the box and then leaving, just commuting home. No. This was a group of people that were chasing after something mm-hmm. and pushing. Another positive thing is there's something about finding fulfillment and worth in the work that you do. Absolutely. The Bible talks about this a lot. Proverbs talks about it all over the place. The importance of working hard and finding fulfillment in that is really, really helpful. Uh, another positive, I think, is that for those who find fulfillment in the chase, although there are costs, people can receive that for which they work, meaning there is some promise uh, that is followed through, that they mm-hmm. say, hey, if you want to gain influence and notoriety, if you work your way up through the corporate ladder, Dude, what other moment, what other place in society can you say something and dozens or hundreds of workers will just jump to whatever you just yeah. said? That's like power. that's a crazy amount of power. It it feels like you are a god in those mm. moments. Mm-hmm. Um, you try doing that with your family or friends, <laughs> like it's not going to happen. But in work, you you spend your life there, and you can make one call and change the lives of hundreds of people. Wow thousands of people Mm -hmm. and so that's i think in some ways there's a positive there that it actually does deliver on its promises at least in that way um now as you could probably figure (laughs) we got a lot of challenges with this uh first off the promise of success like this this dream of getting to the top of the corporate ladder is achieved by just a few People end up chasing a promise of finding, quote, the perfect soulmate job, and they end up unhappy and unfulfilled through much of their lives. They're always searching and discontent that this job isn't checking all the boxes. It's hard to be a hiring manager and give all the promises of what this job could be to check all of your senses of (laughs) self-actualization, you know, goodness sakes. Um, also, identity is tied to success. Absolutely. This is a huge challenge that we are not va- valuable simply because we are, because God made us, but we are valuable because of what we accomplish and do in this viewpoint, which means, you know, you think about the rise of depression and suicide. This comes from people going, I didn't gain the success that I needed to, and thus I view myself as not valuable. Well, sure. And as we came through COVID, there were numerous businesses that did not survive for a multitude of reasons. And when your identity is attached to this thing that you have pursued and through no fault of your own, it is taken away from you. There is this kind of sucking sense of worthlessness. Like, well, now what, what am I valuable for? What can I contribute? Because it was all built, you know, the tower came crashing down. Yeah. And people who had built their identity into what they had created through their work mm-hmm. were left scrambling to figure out if their life still had meaning. Yeah. That oh, is dangerous. So yes. Right. You know, just for any ministry leaders out there, I just want to say 
we can we can fall into this oh. so easily. <laughs> if you For are sure. if you planted a church and you're listening to this and you're saying, "Man, how many people showed up to my last weekend? Mm. Uh, how many people are showing up to this or that ministry that I'm a part of or leading?" Like, there's so many ways that we build our identity based on the work that we do and the success of that work, and that is a horrible, horrible idol to worship. Mm-hmm. That is not a gracious God in any sense. Mm. Um, that is a false God. And, you know, in some ways, this is kind of like a strange dystopian reality here. Derek Thompson, again, um, he says, if you persuade educated young people that income comes second, that no job is just a job, and that the only real reward from work is the ineffable glow of purpose, it is a diabolical game that creates a prize so tantalizing yet rare that almost nobody wins, but everyone feels obligated to play forever, right? You just keep chasing after. It's not, wow. you, you're not allowed to ask for more money because your goal is purpose in life. And so you place all of the goal of purpose, again, in your work. It's good for us to have a purpose. Yeah. And that's actually, we, we do have a purpose and that's where we find so much of our meaning. But when we place all of that weight in our job. Right. And we will keep chasing after that and never quite finding it. And what do you have is a workforce that's going to work really hard mm-hmm. and keep chasing, you know, chasing. I was chasing after wind. A um, couple more, couple more challenges uh, to this viewpoint. One of them is the wider the collar, the more invisible the product. Sure. The, the higher you climb the social, uh, the, the, not the social ladder, the corporate ladder, the more meaningless the work actually starts seeming to be. And, you know, think about it for a moment. You step away from the person-to-person interaction and tangible resources. You know, think for a farmer, it's kind of easy. I pull this food out of the ground. I give it to you for sustenance. You now have survival. Right. But then you think, okay, I'm the chief operating officer. And so what I do is I sit through a few meetings where what we plan through is strategies and concepts that can be helpful to help institute this new statement of meaning and mission statement into, it's like what really was accomplished at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so you end up, it's this strange dynamic. You are running up this ladder, trying to find more meaning. And what you're actually doing is often becoming more and more distant from meaning. Mm -hmm from people and from the the ability to see the impact of your work. Yes, that's right. Uh, and man, you know, they say it's lonely at the top and it <laughs> really is. Like the, the research really does show like you have manufactured appreciation, you have insulation from true feedback. Mm-hmm. This type of living corrupts good character. Nobody is going to challenge you because you are their boss's boss's boss or whatever. And you end up just becoming more and more unchecked. And when you're unchecked, what happens Like you look across the board, people who are higher up in whatever corporations they're a part of can tend towards greater character corruption. Oh, sure. And you have these great major falls and it's really brutal for people and their families and everything else. It's a chasing after the wind. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it reminds me, I was, (laughs) as we were preparing and and studying for this episode, I happened to hear a Bible study and, and the speaker was talking about Howard Hughes. And I mean, we know Howard Hughes as someone, he was incredibly wealthy, successful manufacturer. He was a movie producer. He made the Spruce Goose, which if you grew up in Southern California, you used to be able to go visit by the Queen Mary, right? He rehabbed Vegas from a drug infested gangland to a tourist destination. I mean, he did some things. And yet at the end of his life, he died basically alone. He was addicted to codeine. He was going from hotel to hotel that he owned. He was being cared for by business associates. Um, He had no family. He had no heirs because he had spent all of his time chasing this other thing. So nobody even inherited his $2.5 billion fortune. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, Mm -hmm. it's such a tragic picture to me. I mean, he was clearly brilliant Mm -hmm. and he did amazing things Mm -hmm. and it just evaporated yeah and it's so sad to me yeah and you think okay again the goal here is i want to make a name for myself what is truly built like you want a name it's going to fade you you want riches they will rot you want a legacy to pass on you're just gonna be a tombstone at some point (laughs) you know 
like a dash <laughs> this viewpoint exactly is is a chasing after the wind so now that we've said that let's hear what scripture specifically has to say about yeah. this view uh let's go back to colossians chapter 3 where you started and uh just to remind everybody you started with verse 23 whatever you do work at it with all your heart working is for the lord not for human masters Verse 24, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So like I say, we looked at verse 23. We want to do all of our work, whatever our hands find to do. We want to do it as unto the Lord. This is the what. It's what we do in the mindset of the lens that we work through. We're not just working for our employer. We're working for the Lord. But now when we look at verse 24, it tells us why we do our work. And it directly challenges the Genesis 11 story. So why do we work? Well, because ultimately, this verse tells us the way we do our work will be rewarded. Now, not necessarily with status and significance in this life, although that could happen. But we do it because, as this verse says, we will receive a re- an inheritance from the Lord. So the reason that we've got sort of this status and significance, that's a narrative that has been ingrained that just through culture and through everything that is kind of fed to us all the time, that's what's valuable. So that's what we're working for. And the world has said that accomplishing these things gives you, as we've been saying, meaning, identity. It's This is your legacy. This is your contribution. But the Bible just tells a different story. Now, we've looked at Ecclesiastes already once in this episode, but it's just such a powerful, like, he, nobody can say it better than the teacher. He had everything that this life had to offer. He indulged in any and all excesses that his heart desired. He literally did. He did it all. He had it all. And here's his assessment. This is from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. It says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Oh, ouch. Right? And I mean, if he's like the, um, like the, the ultimate example, like no one ever is going to work as hard as he did. Mm-hmm. No one is ever going to have as much and do as much as he did. And he right. said he did it all, had it all, and it was meaningless his accomplishments his status his significance his pleasure it the result of all of that was that it yielded him nothing yeah it's just tragic yeah and again this is uh, as a misguided story you know in, in many ways i sacrifice my family i sacrifice my mental health i sacrifice my emotional and physical health i do all that for this end goal of making a name for myself and at the end i realize this was this was all meaningless. Yeah. You know, chasing I was chasing after wind. Yeah. And I never quite found that soulmate feel right. of of a job. And so yeah, I, I think in conclusion to this work, in this viewpoint, work is viewed as your way to become a God. Yeah. But along the way, here's the challenge, it becomes your God. Work itself becomes your sure. God. And this is not a God of grace oh, no. or a God of love. It is a task for, just a task driving, uh, often very hateful God. It's an idol we worship that asks for everything and offers nothing in return. Mm. Um, And look, you may be extra influenced by this view. Uh, Maybe you're often working after hours, through the night maybe, not because anyone forced you, but because you choose to. I, I just got a little bit more work to do. If that's a common refrain, you, you may be over-influenced by this view. Maybe you're still looking for that soulmate job and you're discontent with every job you've experienced so far. And you're discontent with your current job because it's not fulfilling all of your desires of self-actualization and transcendence. If that's you, then you're probably in this story. You're responding this way at the bus stop, right? This is the story you're telling <laughs> yourself. And finally, maybe the environment that you live in is so competitive at work. Mm. It's so competitive. You you are not about coworkers, man. You are the one pushing forward. It's a dog eat dog world. And if you got to stab someone in the back, you got to. But when you lose in this viewpoint, man, it feels like you are losing yourself, mm. uh, that your identity 
and your value is being corrupted when you lose at work, then you may be over influenced by this yeah. view. Yeah. So here's the thing. We've just told you two different stories and both of them ended with the teacher of Ecclesiastes <laughs> saying, this is meaningless. So if you're feeling really encouraged right now, <laughs> I'm Hold glad on. you're feeling encouraged. Uh, no, we've got another story for you. Story three, the untold story. Work as deeply fruitful, integrated, and purposeful. Work as vocation. And that's where we're going to go next. Hey, Brandon, we'll tell like you're going to start in Genesis one, right? Yes. All right. So this is going to be the whole, this is going to be the whole story. Okay. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to cruise through this. We don't often tell this story. A lot of times, even in church, the stories that we tell is like, yeah, go to, go to work. And the purpose of your workplace is lunchtime when you can mm. have mm-hmm. that moment to evangelize to your friend. And that is, that's a good thing. A major great thing you can do in work, but Again, that still says that there's all the actual work that you're doing that isn't under the reign of Jesus. God wants to have say in every aspect of your life, and that means even in the menial little tasks that you do at work. And so we're going to dig into God's story about all of this, and hopefully it'll help you achieve that goal. Absolutely. So Genesis 1 starts with this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So let's just pause right there. Genesis 1, notice who is the first worker? God is. God is the first worker, which again, challenges the whole idea that work itself is a have to, that it's something that you just have to do to survive. God doesn't have to work to survive. So right there, we've already expanded work from something far beyond the very first story that we told. It's not just about survival. God now in uh, in Genesis 1, what does he do? He starts doing this amazing work of separating day from night and land from water and light from dark and sky from land and all of this stuff, right? He's just separating all of these different things. He's bringing order out of a formless and empty world, a wild and waste world, right? He's bringing order to all of this. And then what happens? He's being intentional in his work He is taking care of this world. He's making it a place for humans in so many ways. He's bringing out about life and beauty and connection and intentionality. And then in verse 27, God creates people in his own image. In the image of God, he creates them, male and female, he created them. And what does he do? He blesses these humans and he says, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. So what happens here is that God is doing this work. He's, again, making the world. And then what does he do? He hands that over to humans. Now, this first bit of the image of God, what that means is uh, that we are his image bearers That means that God is in charge there. We get to be kind of his representatives into the world. In Mm -hmm. a lot of cities in um, the Roman Empire, they'd put a big pillar right in the middle of uh, of their cities and have uh, have their symbol right on the top of that pillar. And basically what that image was is it said, Rome is in charge here. Sure. So that same word image... It goes back to what it means that we are God's images. We are little expressions saying God is in charge here. And so when he says, look, I want you to carry my image and then go out into the world and rule over it, what is he saying? He's saying, I want you to be my ambassadors in this world, Mm -hmm. to carry out this work I've already started, and now I'm entrusting it to you. The word reign is an interesting one, right? Right. The rule and reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky. We don't use that word very much, right? right? Reign. But essentially what that means is that we feel responsibility for something. When you reign and rule over something, you feel responsibility for it. You know, when uh, when my son Lincoln, five years old, 
had a worm that we found, and we put it in a little 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 plastic box. Mm-hmm. He suddenly had the responsibility to take care of that little worm <laughs> thing, right? He had a reign and rule over that, and that meant he wanted to feed it, he wanted to take care of it, he wanted to tend to it. Mm-hmm. That's, That's what it means. And then you bring your fingerprint to it when you reign and rule over something. You get to put your fingerprint on it. Lincoln got to build a little happy environment for this worm. I don't know how happy it was for the worm, but it had all of the trappings of my son all over it. And so really to reign well means to do this, right? We're, we're continuing on the work that God did in this world. We've been entrusted with it. We can now feel responsibility for it and we get to put our own fingerprint on it. Which is amazing because as we're thinking about work and that first story we talked about, there's a tendency to think about work as like a post-fall thing. You know, like right. if it was a perfect world, we wouldn't have to work. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Exactly. And, oh man, how we view uh, even the end result. We'll get there soon. Yeah. But when we think retirement is kind of the like, okay, I just did the survival stuff that I needed and now I've achieved. And God's like, no, no, no. I worked. Again, God was the first worker. And in then he commissioned paradise. us. Exactly. And then he commissioned us to work in paradise before any sin or any brokenness. Now, what does he say? Be fruitful and multiply. Mm-hmm. Yes, this is about having children. But think, animals didn't need to be told to be fruitful and right. multiply. That doesn't <laughs> happen do any it. other place in Genesis 1, literally. Yeah. Um, but why are humans given this? Well, when humans multiply, we don't just make more humans, we make culture. We make cities, right? We, we, we make art. We make communities. We make generations and generations of viewpoints and philosophies in the world. That's what happens when we multiply. Mm-hmm. And so God's saying, do that work. And this idea about being fruitful, bearing fruit, this is about continuing the creative, order-bringing, resting work that God does. Mm-hmm. Now, notice again in Genesis, at the very beginning of Genesis 2, God rests. So our life is not meant to be just work. Right. So he lays out for us that we are meant to have some time that we work, that we're bringing order, that we're bringing creativity, and then there's time that we rest as well. Our entire identity is not wrapped up in just our work. Right, right. That even God's identity is not wrapped up in what he does. Think about that for a moment. (laughs) Like deep thoughts. (laughs) Yes. If God's only value is what he does for you, Maybe you're not understanding the depth of who God actually is. Okay, moving on. Wow. And finally, what does this what does this say? When he says be fruitful and multiply, what is he saying? This is where the idea of vocation comes in. Sure. And you've probably heard this word vocation. We usually just tie that to my professional kind of job or maybe my like career arc is mm-hmm. like vocation. This just comes from a root word, which, you know, voice, voca, like called. This is, I'm called by God. God has asked me to do something. He has an agenda in the world and he's commissioned us Mm -hmm. to be a part of that agenda. There's meaning behind it. Again, in the Genesis 11, the, I just need to build a tower to myself, make a name for myself. There's no aspect of someone grander than you Mm -hmm. calling you to something. Mm -hmm. You're on your own to make meaning for yourself. But in this vocation, man, there's someone else involved in all of this. And it adds meaning even to work that isn't seen. I think the fact of calling, mm-hmm. I mean, you could be called to motherhood and no one would ever see mm-hmm. the good works that you're doing, but that doesn't yes. make them any less of a vocation, any less of a calling, any less of something that you've been equipped and called by God to do. Yes, So, Amen. Because I think in the Genesis 11 story, your work and your status and your significance, those are based on other people seeing and recognizing what you've done. The tower was awesome because everybody could see it. Yes. Right? Right. <laughs> That's what they were after. We're gonna, mm-hmm. I mean, why would that make a name for themselves? Because everybody would go, wow, look yeah. what they did. There's a lot of things that we're called to do that nobody will ever see. Yeah, the validation doesn't come from the people around us. The validation of the success of our work right. comes from him. Exactly. Yeah. And from the fact that we are called to do it and doing it faithfully, Mm -hmm. that's the value, not if everybody goes, wow, or if nobody notices at all. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Which happens. 
All right, so Genesis 1. Now you move into Genesis 2. It's it's a it's a retelling of the creation story, but with a different focus, a different emphasis. And this one, it's all about the garden. What happens? I'll just read to you this real quick. In Genesis 2, 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Mm. Isn't this beautiful? Now, verse 8 says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. Think about this, that God is the first gardener. He's the one who's planting these things in this picture in Genesis 2. And then what does he do? He places the man there to say, you are now the gardener. Yeah, you're going to care care for it. You're going to tend it. Yes. So Mm. harvest and plant and tend and prune and do all of this beautiful work in the world. Now, now I get that this is still ethereal. Go with me here. So (laughs) that is what... Adam, what, that's what humanity is entrusted to do, is to tend to, to take care of this world. And you may say, Are, is this just environmentalism? Well, it is involving environmentalism. Absolutely, we should be caring for this earth that way. But this means everything in right. this world. It means our culture, our society, our ways of thinking. It means our family, our relationships. It means technological advancement. It means all of these things that we're meant to tend to and care for as gardeners. And so I wonder what we would think if we imagined our work, our jobs, as little corners of the garden Mm. and said, wow, God has asked me to tend to and care for this little garden. Why? So that it may be fruitful, so that it can give greater fruit to other people. Like, you're not going to plant a huge garden this big with all of these trees that are pumping out all these amazing, amazing fruits if it was just Adam and Eve. The whole point of a garden is you're tending to something so that it can expand and serve others. Sure. Um, Okay. Now, into this story, we now have the more completed story of what happens in Genesis 3. That's pre-fall, Genesis 1 and 2. We're gardeners. We're tending to this world. We're taking care of this beautiful work God is doing. We're moving forward his creative work that he began in this world. And then thorns and thistles and the challenges and the difficulties of work. Now, when you hold those things now in tension, it starts to become a much more complete story, doesn't it? Because you say now there's meaning and purpose and there's a grander story, but that doesn't negate the realities of I do have to work to survive. And work does take sweat and pain and toil. Okay, so that's the picture. You jump now forward to Jesus. And what do you have Jesus saying? There, Jesus... In Luke 2, 49, when he's caught in the temple, Mm -hmm. learning about the kingdom of God and and teaching people about the kingdom of God, even as a youngster, they say, why have you run away? What are you doing? And he says, I must be about my father's business. And I think what he's talking about right there is this whole trajectory of work, that I must be about my father's business to do what, to take care of and tend to this world. And when you look at what Jesus did, when you look at his actions, his healings, his conversations, it it wasn't just, well, this person was in need, so I just fixed them. It was, I'm taking care of, I'm tending to this, this whole world. I'm seeing this world as a garden and that part needs pruning. You know, those Pharisees, they need some pruning. (laughs) I need to plant some seeds over here. I mean, think about how many stories he told that had to do with planting, just that he's carrying mm-hmm, on this Genesis mm-hmm. 1 and 2 story all the way through sure. Genesis 3. Thorns and thistles, like think about how the cross plays out as a oh, picture yeah. of the ultimate fulfillment of these curses there in Genesis 3. Mm-hmm. All that to say, at one point, Jesus is talking about work and um, he ends up saying to people, he says, you know what? don't be so worried about what you're going to eat yeah. or what you're going to wear. Don't you know that God cares about these things? Mm-hmm. And what, what does he say? What does he say is the first goal we need to chase after? He says, seek after, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when we say kingdom of God, we're talking the agenda of God in right. this world. Right. Again, this furthering movement of creative order bringing, beautiful, beautifying, life-giving work in this world Mm -hmm. the creative work in the world that is the work of the kingdom so he says seek first the kingdom and everything else will be given to you and he's saying hey if you're worried about 
uh, the food you're going to eat if you're worried just about survival. Yeah. Guess what? Seek first the kingdom. If you are doing your work as unto the Lord in a beautiful way and you're understanding your work as part of this grander story, mm -hmm. you're going to be surviving just fine. You're going to be getting yeah. the food you need. And hey, you want to be all dressed all cool and you want to look all great? Guess what? Do the flowers, are they dressed better than Solomon was even though he reached the top of the corporate ladder? Yeah. yeah. So don't you be chasing after that e either. Seek first after the kingdom of God. And then this ends. Here's the thing. This ends in Revelation 22, 1 through 5, in this beautiful picture. And Linda, you were getting at this previously. Oh, man, here's the thing. I know, I got excited. <laughs> it's No, it's so good because here's the thing. When we think about retirement, in the Genesis 3 story, the thorns and thistles incomplete story, retirement is the end goal and it's the time that I just rest and I can finally be done with this darn work that has mm -hmm. sucked life mm -hmm. out of me. In Genesis 11, if there's a retirement at all, it's the place where I get to just bask in all of the great name that I've made for myself. I get to finally get to the top of the corporate ladder right. and I sit on the top of the pyramid or, you know, the tower. <laughs> like that's where I get to sit. What's crazy is the picture of retirement in the grand story is this. Check this out. Uh, Revelation 22, 1 through 5. It says, this is the last chapter in the Bible. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Mm. So notice right here what we have is a city and a garden, a river going through a city. It's a city, it's a garden city. Because now this creative work has continued onward. Mm -hmm. There was nothing wrong about uh, the city that was built in Babel, except that it was built towards making a name for ourselves, sure. mm -hmm. not carrying out God's grand mission. Listen to verse 3. There no longer will there be any curse. Mm -hmm. So there it is. Genesis 3 now has been dealt away with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No longer will there be any curse. Does that mean I shouldn't work anymore? Well, let's see. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp to light or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And check this out. And they will reign forever and ever. They will reign forever and ever. It doesn't just say God will reign. They. Right. All, all the people that are in this beautiful garden city will continue carrying out this reign and rule that we were commissioned to in Genesis 1 and 2. That continues on for all of eternity. So here's the thing, friends. If you are thinking about work and you think, well, finally when I get to heaven, that is the divine retirement center, and I'm going to be playing shuffleboard, and it's going to just be great. Let me tell you, no. No. No, no, no. The picture here is that the work we do will actually be continuing on for eternity. That somehow this creative order bringing work in this world that got started in Genesis 1 will carry on and we get to be a part of it for eternity. So that hopefully changes your concept of work. And it just, it strikes me as you're, I'm going to see if I can put good words around this <laughs> because it just kind of was coming to me as you know, as followers of Jesus, we, when we are, when we trust him, we are made holy, but then we are in the process of being made holy, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this, this process that's going on, this redeeming that's going on kind of through the rest of our lives until we reach the point where we're with him and then that is complete. And the work that we do, God is redeeming what we're doing and reconciling what we're doing you know, once we are followers of him, it changes what we're doing. Like I may have the same job today. I get saved and I go to that same job tomorrow, but God is going to begin doing a different thing through me in that work. As followers of Jesus, everything we do changes and it may not be perfect yet. You know, you're talking about revelation 22. That's when the curse will be completely removed and our work will be, you know, 
it will not be this toil and sweat of the brow and all that. But even in the meantime, God is redeeming and reconciling the work that we do and using that work for these greater purposes. So, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you think about what this means for us right now as we're working in our current jobs and you're like, okay, yeah. I'm a cashier. Okay. And you're talking work will continue on for eternity, order, creative work, order bringing work. What's, what's, what's going on here? How exactly does this work? How does this play out for me now? Well, the story that we tell ourselves about work will shape mm-hmm. how we come to our work. So how can you be shaped by this story of work? First off, Linda, yeah, talk to absolutely. us about this. So the first thing that you've got to get clear in your head is that you do work, but you are not your work. Your identity comes from being in Christ. Your identity comes from who God says you are. And it is not dependent on anything you have done or not done. It is not dependent on anything that you will achieve. It is, it is not earned. It is not something you have to sustain. He, he has chosen us. He loves us. We are his beloved. And so that identity, when those two get confused, when they get confounded, then if work is going good, then I'm good. Mm. But if work is not going good, if work, like what happened, like I mentioned earlier, during COVID, when, when businesses shut down and, and just, you know, jobs evaporated, or if I get fired or laid off, if my purpose and my identity is in that job that I have, then that's a very fragile place to have it. Um, but if my identity is rooted in Christ and what he says about me, which is not connected to my work, mm-hmm. he has prepared good work for me to do. He's also given me the strength and the wisdom and everything I need to do it. But that is not even still who I am. Yeah, if I'm trying to extract meaning and value from my work, rather than pouring value and meaning Absolutely. into work because I've start, I've rooted my identity in him, it, um, it, it's just so much different in how that energy plays out. Right, because when I walk into a situation, I walk in as a redeemed child of God. I yep. walk in as a daughter, a princess of the king. I walk in as a representative um, as of the kingdom, as mm-hmm. a, as a ambassador. ambassador. There's the word. I'm like, what is the word? That's great. So if I view my work in this larger story of God's grand mission for this world, and I'm a part of it, um, first off, my identity will not be wrapped in my success or failure in my job specifically. Absolutely. Yeah. I think secondly, uh, how can we be shaped by this complete but untold story of work is, is realizing that our work matters somehow it it echoes in eternity i want to walk through just a few examples here uh because you may be listening and you're like okay how does my part my job and my career fit into this creative order bringing work that god is doing in the world that he's called us into well let's walk through a few examples first off let's just say you're a teacher Mm. you're an elementary school teacher and you're like okay how did i How's this part of like tending to and caring for the garden? Well, think about it. The next generation is your garden. Yeah. And you are called to plant and to harvest, to, to harvest what previous teachers have poured into these kids to develop and to plant, to plant curiosity and a desire for knowledge. You're, you're teaching them maybe early on how to read, which would help them read the words of scripture later right. on. You're, you're teaching them how to communicate, which may allow them to connect and offer love to another. You are planting those seeds of God's real cosmic work in the world into the next generation. Let's say you're a pilot. You're like, okay, well, what, is, what is my part to play in this whole thing? Think about it. In this increasingly digital world, what you are doing as a pilot is you're bringing people together. You're bringing somebody from point A to point X so that they can meet face to face with somebody. Mm. Maybe because it's a a business job, maybe because they want to see family, but you simply by just getting them there quicker, you're making this world smaller. You're increasing connection of what God would actually desire for us. If if you're a stay-at-home parent and you're saying, where's my part to play in all Mm. of this? Goodness, I mean, this is not a hard one to jump to because it's so clear. You are discipling your kids. You are getting the chance to practice and carry out love daily. You are tending to and caring for that child that is in front of you or those children that are in front of you. If you're a city planner, 
And you're saying, what is, how does my job as a city planner work? Think about it. You're bringing order out of chaos. This is where people live their lives, where they carry out most of, of their days. And you bringing more beauty, more structure, more clarity into where they go and what they do, you are doing God's true work. Think about mm-hmm. God in Genesis 1 of separating land from water and sky from land and day from night. You are doing that type of work as a city planner. I'm going to keep going. Just a few more. Yeah. I'm a chef. Okay, what what do I get to do as a chef? You're taking the raw materials of this world. You're taking that tomato and that piece of meat and you're making it into something that is gloriously um, beneficial to those who eat it. It's both an art piece and it's sustenance. Like you're Mm. giving life to people from something Mm -hmm. pulled out of the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, a a huge percentage of entry-level jobs are cashiers. And you say, okay, what do I do as a cashier? How do I view myself as a part of this larger story of what God is doing? Look, you're not just there to get a paycheck. And you're not just there to work your way up into, you know, greater corporate appreciation or whatever. What you're there for is you are giving resources to creators and developers of products and you're creating a just society where people are paid for their work and you're also being a momentary interaction with that person who's going to come and buy that Starbucks from you or that piece of clothing from you. You are being a brief interaction with another human during that day. What are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. How are you viewing yourself as a part of this grander story? How can we be shaped by the story of work? We said, let's not tie our identity right. to our success or failure as jobs. The second one is understand that our work somehow echoes in eternity. Which is amazing to consider. So amazing. And the third one, Linda, take that away. Sure. It's to realize that our vocation is more than just our career, but it involves it, certainly. One of the passages about work, we we haven't really talked about this one yet, but 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and it's starts in verse 12 and he's talking about the foundation that has been laid that is Jesus and then what we build on it you know with our lives and he's using this metaphor to talk about the work that we will do in our lives and he says that if anyone builds on this foundation using gold silver or costly stones wood hay or straw their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light so there's this sense that at the end of time when we stand before Jesus all of our work will be put before God and he will evaluate what we've done. Now, when we think about this, a lot of times we separate it out and we go, well, I did this job and I did these things, but then I did this ministry stuff and I went on mission and and that's the work that God's going to look at. That's the gold, silver, and precious stones. But the actual like physical go to work, punch in, do my work. We don't think that that's what God's looking at. We don't think that that's what God is referring to, that'll probably be wood, hay, and stubble. You know, it's just boring. I don't want to deal with that. You know, you could have somebody that's getting up for the fourth time in the middle of the night. No one's going to see it. No one's going to make a great name because they just got up to change that kid for the fourth time in the middle of the night. But when done, recognizing the privilege it is to love that little person, the stewardship of this life, the, the, all of those things that go into it, doing it for the Lord, you've entrusted this little person to me and I'm going to love this little person in the middle of the night. That, Jesus says, that's gold, silver, and precious stones. When I come to my work and recognize that it's bigger than just this act, I am, I'm imaging Christ in the way that I'm responding, in the way that I'm interacting, in the way that I'm, I'm, treating this little person or whatever you're doing when somebody's, you know, comes into, you know, if you're making coffee or if you're, I think a lot about coffee, but if you're, you know, if you're doing that, but you're looking at the people in front of you and you're recognizing them and you're dignifying them by looking them in the face, if you know their name, you say their name, you, you love them just by the way that you interact with them. And that's going to be the gold, silver and, and precious stones is how we loved, how we served, how we met people in our environments, no matter where we are. Mm. Yeah. So let's uh, let's wrap this up here. So you may be saying, "All right, what do I what do I uh, what do I do about this?" <laughs> it's been helpful. I I know that I may be maybe over influenced by um, one of these first two stories, maybe a misguided story, um, soulmate work. You know that that's how I'm going to make a name for myself, or maybe you've just been over influenced by this view that work is just boring and terrible, and I just got to do it and take my paycheck and survive. Um, how do I get shaped by this larger 
larger story of work that God has written. Here are just two, two steps I want to give you, two kind of real kind of takeaways for this. Today, after listening to this, uh, set aside 10 minutes, just 10 minutes. I'm telling you this will be so transformational and beneficial for you. And think about the work that God did in the beginning. Think about this world as a garden that we are meant to tend to, right? The culture, the people, the art, the, the earth itself. Like these are all things we're meant to tend to and care for. You are a gardener. You have a little bit of that garden. How does your job work into that grand story? Mm, that's good. Come up with a phrase or two. I, if, if you're a teacher or a chef or a pilot, I've already given that to you. But <laughs> wrestle with that. How does your work fit in God's grander story of what he is doing in the world? And then tomorrow, when you wake up and you're getting ready for work, remind yourself of that as you go to work and just watch what happens. Do a little reminder on your phone. Let it just come up a few times throughout your day to say, look, you're doing more than just offering a cup of coffee to somebody. You are a part of God's grand work in this world. And this Mm -hmm. little action you're doing will be valued, appreciated by God, but also will be a part of this amazing work he will continue on doing into eternity. Uh, That's a really, really cool thing. So that's my suggestion to you. Um, Thanks so much for listening. Hey, friends, it's been so fun to be with you. Um, I hope you've been encouraged and challenged, and we will be back with you next month.